Hey everybody, I'm really glad you found Suncrest Messages. I do hope you'll take a minute to subscribe to either our podcast or our YouTube channel. And you can also download the Suncrest app. There's great stuff there that goes far beyond these messages. Either way, I hope that the next 30 minutes helps you integrate faith with your life. Enjoy. Well, welcome to everyone who calls Suncrest home and everyone else who's joining us online this weekend. Can you believe we're not even halfway through the year 2020? It's been a year that's already been marked with crises. And of course, there's two challenges that we're facing more than anything else right now. But I actually want you to think about how these are very distinct challenges. Think about the virus. The virus didn't even exist eight months ago. The virus sets the timeline, as the doctors say. It's what will decide when it comes and goes. And one of the things about the virus is that most of us are very much looking forward to getting back to the way things were. But the other challenge we face emerged 13 days ago on Memorial Day. A black man named George Floyd was killed at the hands of a white police officer. And this is important, it was captured on video. I hope you've watched the video. It shines light on something that needs light shined on it. And this particular issue that has raised racial tension and issues of racial injustice is, of course, just one more marker in a series of markers. It was just a few weeks ago that the video of Ahmaud Arbery came out, another black man killed at the hands of white men. And I want us to think about how different this challenge is than the virus. First of all, this is not eight months old. This has been part of the story of our country from our beginning. Second, this matter is not driven by a virus or by the timeline of racism. This is actually entirely in our hands to decide how long this will last in our country. And I pray that none of us have a posture that says we want to go back to the way things were. There was never a time when this was great, and there's no way to think we should go back to some other version of how race was handled in our country. There's only a way forward. And so today, we're going to tackle the subject of racial injustice. And let me draw attention to one other big difference. With the virus, I can tell you that Suncrest and myself have faced all kinds of decisions that are outrageously difficult. Many times, I don't even know for sure what we should do. But on the issue of racial injustice, the decisions for me aren't difficult about this at all. I know exactly what we should do. I know exactly who Suncrest is. And it was the easiest decision in the world to interrupt the message series that we were in to decide, yeah, we need to address this together as a church today. Part of that is because we know who we are. Over the last few years, we've tried to address injustice and racial injustice in particular multiple times. We posted a message earlier this week on our social media feeds that was a message that takes kind of a high view perspective about the issues around racial injustice. Today is going to be much more practical, but we've had conversations on race at our church. When I did a message about Northwest Indiana in particular, I named that racism is our biggest issue. And in that message, this was so fascinating to me, I had decided previous to the message about Northwest Indiana to survey our church and ask people what they thought the issues were in Northwest Indiana. One of the questions was about diversity and racism. And actually the answer to that survey showed me something. All the white people in our church felt like diversity and racism was a strength in Northwest Indiana. And All the black people in our church thought that diversity and racism was not a strength in Northwest Indiana. It was exclusively drawn on those lines. And so we've decided to lean into this conversation many times. There's another part of what Suncrest is that shapes this entirely. How many times have you heard me use creation, broken, redemption, restoration? And every time I talk about brokenness, I describe that this world is not the way God wants the world to be because there is so much wrong with it. And I don't know a bigger thing in our country that's wrong with it than racism. And then when I talk about restoration, I call on us. I've called on you to say, when you look around at the broken places of this world, 
What you cannot do is turn a blind eye and walk away. But instead, as a follower of Jesus, we engage it and we decide to be part of a solution to the problem that's out there. You know, maybe the other thing about Suncrest is that we tackle sensitive subjects all the time. We're not afraid of them, and I actually think we have a pretty good lane for tackling them because we're not a church that sensationalizes things. Instead, we feel like we can create space for a conversation and for some dialogue. There can be room for disagreement on various points. There can even be a, a place where we can, we can encourage one another. But we take seriously the effort to pull things apart and explain them because we're trying to understand and get better. And one of the things that's happened at Suncrest is that people who are really hypersensitive, you know, people who get their shorts in a bunch really easily, um, they seem to have just left our church. And that wasn't really my aim. I wasn't trying to get rid of them. But in the end, I'm actually kind of okay with it because I want a community here that can handle the conversations about difficult subjects. And so today, we're going to talk about racial injustice. And I'm very grateful that God has placed in my life over the last decade many, many friends who are people of color who I could reach out to this week so that my voice isn't the only voice in this conversation. I had rich conversations with three of my friends, and you're going to get to hear um, a little bit from each of those conversations. So I want to just simply introduce those three friends to you today. The first is Javier Lofton. Javi is actually a family member. He married my wife's cousin. In fact, I performed the wedding ceremony. And Javi's from the Chicago area and serves in the unique role right now of being a police officer himself. I got the chance to talk to Derek Puckett. Derek has become a great friend because we helped him start a new church in Chicago. He's from Gary originally, and his church in Chicago is a model church for being multi-ethnic, and he's become a leader in the city on all issues of race. And this is Marisa Winslow. Many of you know Marisa. She's not only a part of our church, she's a leader here. And while you may know her because she has an amazing voice and leads us in worship pretty often, I know her because she has character and she lives in these diverse spaces that help us navigate many things. And so I've asked all three of these friends to speak candidly to our predominantly white church. And while every person I talk to, everyone has had multiple encounters with law enforcement that were not positive, not a single one of them were on a rant against every law enforcement officer. And I actually want you to hear a story from Javi first, because I asked him if all the perceptions that are out there about police affect how he does his job. Uh, this was two years ago, 2018, where we had a guy who was fleeing from us. And as he's fleeing from us, he was shooting out the window. He was trying to kill us, essentially. Um, and, you know, the officer who the officer who was in the front of that pack, and it sounds crazy, I'm like four cars behind. He's in front. He's taking fire. But that was like my, that's my right-hand right -hand man. So I wanted to go up there to help him. And it was to the point where he was going to start shooting out his windshield at this car to get it stopped. Now it's a tactic that we train because we're all SWAT. Well, me and him, we're both in our SWAT team. So that's something that we've trained for. You never know you might be in that situation. But I think if you would have shot the windshield, how would the, the, the world see that? They're going to say cop shot at the person. Well, we probably took seven rounds and never returned fire, but he's almost really close to doing so. Um, so that kind of makes you think like we would have been all over the news for a shoot, and the guy was a mixed guy, uh, black male, but he's very light skin. Uh, but it would have looked bad, white cop shoot, black male. That's what the the, the, the headline would have been. Yeah. Uh, but he, he would have done everything right because it was a deadly force situation where, I mean, I don't know how nobody, you know, a lot of people have never been shot at before. It's not a good feeling, I can tell you that. <laughs> um. <laughs> so how many of you have ever been shot at? Listen. On a day like this, we can all be grateful for all the good cops who put themselves on the line to protect us every day. So when we think about racial injustice, there's really two categories. When it comes to racial injustice, everyone has individual experiences. These are the stories that we tell. They're the actual experiences that you've had that may have been positive or negative. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or another race, 
all of us have individual experiences. But also when it comes to racial injustice, everyone is part of the system. And I wanna spend some time today thinking a little more broadly about how you and I engage the injustice that's part of our system. You know, America is a country where everyone acknowledges that there is racism, and essentially no one considers themselves a racist. This is the distinction between the individual element and the racist element. And because of that distinction, I have one very clear goal today. I wanna move everyone who's part of our church from being not racist to being anti-racist. To move from being not racist to anti-racist. And the wisdom of the black voices that I wanna amplify for you today, I think will help us to get there. Really, this gets described in three very simple moves. They could even be described as steps that build on one another. Here's number one. To be anti-racist, listen. Just listen. Listen to grow. Listen to understand. Open yourself up to the idea that you've possibly been wrong or sheltered or uninformed or misinformed. And listen to the voices that are out there. Watch the videos that are out there and let it penetrate you. Listen, even this week, Drew Brees had an experience with this. His first comments came before he listened. And then he offered what I thought was a tremendous apology, but only after he listened. And so I want you to hear from these three friends about how important it is to open ourselves up. I will say, just listen. Um, and you know, you don't be judgmental because <clears throat> I think, again, I think the TV, the media is portraying, you know, us to be bad. Um, I'm not necessarily saying you need to go out and, and hang out with black people all day. I mean, just, but just everybody's different, but the same, we're the same as well. Um, just listen. That's where it's really hopeless when you're now talking to your white brothers and sisters that you thought got it. And they really don't. They, they missed it totally. And they're not saying anything. They're silent when it comes to these issues. Um, they're silent when they're speaking up to you. Because then it says, man, they didn't really care about me. They just, they just needed me for something. He did not believe that violence was necessary. He believed wholeheartedly and peaceful um, protesting. And guess what? He was still assassinated. Mm -hmm. So, the question at hand is, how do you protest? You can't do it peacefully. You can't, you can't do it if you're a celebrity. You can't do it if you take a knee. You can't do it if you speak out against it at award shows. You can't, so a protest, that's the whole purpose of a protest is to, it's not the norm for, it's something that's, supposed to create change and it's supposed to stand out in some capacity and no i don't think that the looting is the is the way to go but what do you do you know it's like what do you do so what do you do that's that's the 400 year long question mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. so a question for you how did you feel, especially when you were listening to Marisa talk there at the end? When we talk about protests, some people can get a little defensive, but defensive is the very posture that keeps us from listening. Instead, let me cast a vision to you from the scriptures. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, the Bible says, if one part of the body suffers, all the other parts suffer with it. Marisa is part of our body. The black community is part of the body of Christ. And when one part of the body suffers, it's good that we all suffer with it. One of the phrases I heard my friends use all the time is they say, I'll be in a conversation and someone will cut me off and they'll say, but what about? But what about this? What about that? And the phrase, but what about, is just a phrase that says, I'm not listening. I'm defensive. I'm deflecting. And people get hyper defensive about things that are obviously true. 
Take the phrase Black Lives Matter. I don't know why people are so defensive about that. Nobody is suggesting that only black lives matter. Of course, all lives matter. If you'll listen when people talk about this, the message is, yes, all lives matter, but all lives can't matter until black lives matter, and it's black lives that are in jeopardy right now. Can't we all agree with that? It's a phrase that we open ourselves up to pretty quickly if we'll listen. And we can do this. We can open ourselves to understand instead of being defensive and deflecting. Before I move on, I want you to hear something Derek says about this. It, it, I like to say you're going to take these figurative slap in the face, uh, slaps in the face a bit, and it has nothing to do with you. I'm just sharing my feelings. So my villain, feelings are feelings, period. When you listen to people's feelings, they're always valid. They may be misguided, but they're, you need to be able to affirm someone's feelings. And so if I'm sharing my feelings, it's also knowing that as I'm talking to you, Greg, I'm not really talking about you. I'm talking about the whole system in itself, although it may be uh, making you furious because you're in this and you're a white male. I'm not really talking about you. And so what you're doing also by affirming my feelings and saying, I hear you, I'm with you, maybe not saying, oh, because what would have happened is saying, well, I didn't do that. You know, I'm not part of that. It's like, well, I'm not saying that. Just affirming, like, I hear you, man, that's tough. That allows me to know that, oh, he actually is listening to me. Maybe I can tell more. I tell him more. All right, number two, to be anti-racist, learn. One of the greatest gifts of our lives has been to have a black son and to be raising a black one-year-old. And sometimes people come to me and say, hey, Greg, you must understand because you have a black son. And I'm like, no, no, no. That's not what having a black son has done for me. It hasn't made me an expert in any way at all. It's only made me very aware of how little I know and how little I was interested in knowing. Sometimes in conversations about race, I'll have people say to me, well, Greg, I don't understand why. I don't understand why. I don't understand why. And I always think, oh, you should listen to yourself say that. When you say, I don't understand why, the next sentence out of your mouth can't be a rant. The next sentence out of your mouth ought to be, so I'm going to try to learn. I don't understand, so I'm going to learn. And this is kind of the question. Have you tried to understand? Have you read a book? Have you read the biography of Frederick Douglass? Have you read the new Jim Crow? Have you watched a documentary on Netflix? I got all kinds of recommendations for my conversations. And if you're a Netflix person, um, you should just watch the 13th. Watch it and learn. The history of our system has so many things built into it. Will you listen to these perspectives? But long story short, I mean, when you look at what's going on in the world, I, I don't probably, I don't necessarily agree with the looting and rioting, but at the same time, it's a small part of me that it's, you're, you're seeing too much stuff happen online. I mean, it's, this is 2020, cameras everywhere, and you have some police officers that's, that's making it bad for everybody. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, yeah, I don't, definitely, I don't agree with people, you know, tearing down businesses, their community. Um, I think it's a right way and a wrong way. But as again, I understand because it's so much built in, it's so much oppression, there's years of this. And then some things, honestly, I feel you can Google. Like you don't have to ask me every single thing that happens or that, um, that pertains to, to all things black. There are some things that you can find out on your own in your own timing. And I mean, let's be real, there's things that I've had to find out because they don't teach us a lot of things in history books about black history. You know, they teach certain things. You know, you hear the, the Rosa Parks, you hear the, the Martin Luther King, you don't hear every aspect. So, I mean, let's be real, who heard about the, the bombing in Tulsa? Like, that's not, thing, that's not stuff that was taught in, in, in our history books, you know? Um, so some things you just kind of have to, to figure out and learn on your own, in your own time, in your own space. Give me some sense of human dignity. There's also this system of injustice towards the, the economic plight between, uh, and that's not just white and black, that's, that's, that's a rich and poor thing there. You know? so, but a lot of times black folks 
um, depending on where they live, especially in Chicago, are in those lower income areas, food deserts. Uh, where, why are there no grocery stores? And so it gives you this, for myself, it opens up this larger pl uh, part of my mind and brain and heart to say, to look at the whole system, which is where I think a lot of people miss it because they look at this incident as just a one incident. For, but for black people, this is an incident that highlights the whole system of injustice, the prison system, the food deserts within black neighborhoods, the, the redlining that has occurred where we couldn't live in certain neighborhoods um, throughout history. So out of all the things we can learn, history is actually a great place to start. Now, I mentioned a little while ago that I once did a message on this, and I went through an exercise that I want to do very briefly right here. So think about this with me. Um, think about how successful you consider yourself to be, and we'll use a baseball metaphor. Maybe you feel like you've struck out, struck out. You're a complete failure. Maybe you feel like you've grounded out, like, yeah, life isn't really working out. Maybe you feel like you've hit a single. You're on base, but nothing special. A double, a triple, or maybe you feel like you're super successful and you hit a home run. And then I asked people to reflect on different things from our upbringings that shaped who we are, because we're all a combination of the choices we've made and the circumstances that we were born into. And one of the things that I asked people to walk through was to think about their various circumstances that they were born into. Think about this. What education were you given? Access to health care do you have? What race are you? What gender are you? You can do a whole thing, family structure, financial viability, all these things. And when I started to go through the list of the advantages I was given, here's what I learned. I think I hit a home run, but I was actually born on third base. It's just the way it is. And I don't have to feel guilty about it. And I could have made many choices that took me backwards from third base. But to suppose that the life I was born into didn't give me an advantage or to use a loaded word, didn't give me a privilege, I think is just denying our reality. And here's one of the pieces where I think we can learn. It's when we understand that race in America isn't only one element of what I was born into, but many times because of the system, race correlates with lack of health care, lack of financial viability, more likely to be put into prison, all these other things that are part of our system. And so I'm asking you to open your mind to that, to be someone who's a student, not a critic, and takes a learning posture. Here's number three. To be anti-racist, you have to love. And when I use the word love, you know this, I don't mean some soft, sentimental, can't we all just get along sort of love. I mean a love that the Bible describes that is patient and is kind. It's a love that bears all things. And it means us taking steps out of our comfort zone and engaging conversations so that I can make sure I'm not just not racist, but I lean into being anti-racist. I think Marisa has a great example of what that looks like. I had another friend who was like, you know, I had a, my grandfather, he said some really like, racist things. And I was so taken aback that I just didn't say anything. And I said, those are the moments. Those are the things that you can do. Though you speak out against it. I, it doesn't matter who it is. Wrong is wrong. And it's not to say that you have to do it in a disrespectful way. I understand you don't want to feel like you're disrespecting your, you know, your elders or your, but it's as simple as saying, grandpa, like, you can't say stuff like that. That's not right. Those are the moments, because those are the people that you affect the most, the people that are closest to you. You know, and if you can't reach that group of people, then what makes you think that you can reach out to other people if you, if, if, you know, you can create change within a community, but you can't create change within your family. Like, that's where it starts. It starts at home. So those are the little changes that you can make. Those are the little things you can do within your workspace. If you hear people making racist jokes or comments or whatever, you know, those are the moments that you, that you take a stand, you know? So it doesn't have to be this big extravagant, you know, I'm going to um, post to the world, like I'm with black people. But after this, because th this is going to keep happening until things 
come to a halt until everybody comes together to create change for it. It's going to keep happening. So yes, you posted for the blackout yesterday. That's great. You showed solidarity and support. But what are you doing every day after that? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do to combat racial inequality or injustice? Because if it was women's equality and women were getting treated a certain way, you, you're going to speak out against that because you're a woman, you know, and you would hope that the men in your life would do the same thing for you. That's practical wisdom for us every day. And then, of course, I was talking with my friend Derek, who's a pastor, and he kind of just started preaching. So I'm just going to let him preach this section of the message. The first thing I would say is that and we see Jesus do this very clearly, is when he gets to know people, there, there's, a, there's a sense of proximity and the proximity gap that, that closes. You know? So when he sits down with the woman at the Samaritan well, he's not sitting outside of Samaria yelling at her. He's sitting at a well by himself with her, with a woman who's been ostracized from society. She's had five different husbands. Uh, she, she's, she's an adulterous woman. You know, she's Nobody wants to talk to her. And then on top of that, it's a woman he's not married to, so he shouldn't have been talking to her. And she's Samaritan. So this is a 700-year-old hatred between Jews and Samaritans. But Jesus pulls up real close to her and doesn't tell, him, tell her that he's Jesus. He just talks a, a regular conversation. Can I get some water? And she's like, you want water from me? You're a Jew. And he engages her. And eventually it leads to him uh, sharing the truth about who he is with her. Um, and, and, a, and a revival breaks out in the land with many Samaritans, but that first part is the proximity. He closes the gap. He goes in. And if you read the story, she like makes jabs at him. Like there's punches, like you're a Jew. What, why you want to, you don't, we want to talk to me? Like you should get water by yourself. No, we worship over here. You worship over there. Okay, Jesus, really tell me about you. So she's kind of like coming at him and he continues to come back in a way that's palatable and acceptable for her. And she doesn't turn her away. He just, they just continually have this conversation. What we have to realize is that there has always been a majority culture in America that hasn't had to get entangled in a lot of these other cultures. So it's easy to, to stay out of it. But right now, I think that's where I'd like to say there's a sense of hope, hopefully, that we're actually going to jump in. And this isn't just going to be a one-off incident. We're going to, like you said, we're, we're two, feet, two feet in. Like, I'm going to be aware of my own ignorance, and I'm going to jump in, and I'm going to gain knowledge as well as close the proximity gap and get to know people that are like me. And that's where Suncrest, our priest, been a part of the family. You guys have supported us for, I think, five years. You've been on our management team. You do care about renewal, you care about my life. But we live in where you guys are, it's, you got black people all around, you know, people of all color, um, is Gary, there's Hammond, you got, you know, even Munster, my, my cousins live out that way. It's, uh, there's ways to engage um, and, and, and change little spaces like our dinner tables and saying, well, I'm not gonna just eat with all the people that I normally eat with, but I'm going to be intentional about inviting people into this intimate space and having that sense of proximity close. And now we're, we're close now and we're going to have an intentional conversation and do life together. I always tell people real life change happens at dinner tables. It's not just from the pulpit. It's your dinner table. What's that look like? How are you changing that? And so that's where I would say like, we have to grow to the space where uh, black lives matter and everyone needs to say they do matter to me. So I'm going to fight for it. So that's it, my friends. Relationships really matter. And I'm asking you to lean in. If you haven't shared the dinner table with someone of a different race over the course of the past month, I want you to think about what that means for your relationships, for your understanding, and honestly, for your ability to be anti-racist. And I want to ask every person at our church to make sure that within the next month, you do share the dinner table with someone of a different race. My friends, I talk to us all the time about the question, what does love require of us? The model for how we live our lives is Jesus himself, who said, love one another just as I have loved you, love one another. 
And right after he said that, he went to the cross. And it reminds us that love that doesn't cost us something isn't love at all. And especially for my white brothers and sisters. I want to ask you, in this season, and I mean this season, not just this moment, not something we move on from when the media moves on, but in this season, we stand with our black brothers and sisters in a way that we are even willing to let it cost us something because we love them. I want to leave you with this proverb today. Proverbs 31.8, speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. Ensure justice for those who are being crushed. Suncrest, this is who we are. We will listen, we will learn, we will love, and the love looks like speaking up for our black brothers and sisters and ensuring no one's crushed. Heavenly Father, thank you for making things so clear to us. Even if they're difficult, even if they're challenging, we know what is the right thing to do. And God, I pray that our county and our country would experience a new birth into something that's bright and beautiful and reconciled and unified. But God, I do not pray for a weak unity that expects everyone just to ignore the past and act like everything's fine. I ask for a unity that causes us to move into spaces that are uncomfortable, into conversations that will challenge us, and that we will come together because we took the time to fight for those who aren't like us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I really hope that was helpful for integrating faith with life. Listen, if you're in Northwest Indiana, I'd love to have you join us in person. Head over to suncrest.org and plan your visit.